We come now to the time when the primate gets an opportunity to address the General Synod. Greetings to members of General Synod, visitors, and to our special guests, especially Bishop Anthony Pogo and Bishop Franklin, who will join us later. I want to begin my address with a reflection on who we are as Anglicans, as part of the Church of Jesus Christ in the world. For everything we will decide here about our life as a church begins with knowing our roots. There is, a, there it is. <laughs> I, supposed to be some slides. <laughs> As Anglicans, we are a diverse gathering of women, men, and young people from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences, indigenous people, descendants of early settlers and relative newcomers, dispersed in a wide array of settings and circumstances, urban, suburban, rural, and isolated, from coast to coast to coast. All of us have been called into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ in baptism. Around us, we see many models of being church. Some are independent individual congregations where decisions are made for that particular gathered community by that community alone. Others belong to denominations where key decisions are made centrally and apply to everyone around the world. And still others are in between with some commitments made locally and others requiring broader consultation. There is much about church life that finds its roots in the gatherings of the early synagogue, or the civil structures of Roman life, or the political realities of early Christian communities, or subsequent schisms, and sometimes tangentially to the gospel itself. There can be many ways to live out the core principles of our faith in community. So what are the assumptions, principles, and values that we share as Anglicans and commit to together? Of course, we believe that our particular form of being church is the best for us. We need to know and understand those things that are particularly Anglican, the basic principles that undergird and shape our common life. And they are worth naming again and committing ourselves to them so that the life we envisage for our Anglican Church of Canada is rooted there first. And so that the decisions we make here at General Synod will reflect those commitments. The church is first and foremost the people of God. A people created by God in and for love, who gather for worship, prayer, mutual care, education, and fellowship, all in preparation to be sent out into the world to make and nurture disciples. Jesus taught what kind of community he expects us to be. We are a community where no one is more important than another. Where each member loves one another as Jesus loves us. A community that is called to unity as we heard in our scripture last evening, and a community called to make and nurture disciples. St. Paul exhorted the early church to be a place where all are equal. And St. Peter reminded us our primary call is to serve one another. In such a community, sharing resources for the common good of all is expected. And St. Paul also repeatedly in his letters gives us a powerful central image of the church as the body of Christ with Jesus as its head and us, each of us as members. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. The joint membership with one another and with Christ is experienced first and foremost when we gather at the Eucharistic table. Because there is one bread, we who are many 
are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. St. Paul was crystal clear in the practical implications of these convictions for the church. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Perhaps the most extensive working out in scripture comes in the 12th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, where here we read of unity through diversity, of interdependence, of the elimination of distinctions between strong and weak, inferior and superior. And in such a body, we acknowledge each member's gifts and our mutual need of them all. We each have distinctive roles to play, but we all share a common commitment. If one member suffers, we all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. As Anglicans, we follow our ancestry in the Roman Catholic Church through formal structures that help us to maintain continuity, but with a reformed understanding of the synodical place of laity, clergy, and bishops discerning together. We establish dioceses in a geographic area for the sake of ministry as needed in local places led by a bishop. Ecclesiastical provinces coordinate ministry for the whole of a province and connect with the wider community of other churches and the worldwide Anglican communion as the province of Canada. We are a family of juridically independent but recognizably connected churches in which each part assists the other and which together share a common liturgical heritage and commitment to the essential elements of the sufficiency of the Old and New Testaments for salvation, of Episcopal leadership, of our holding to the creeds of the Apostles and Nicene creeds, and the primary sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. Anglican structures have sought to honor unity and context we are one family in the Anglican Church of Canada, and by history and mutual commitment to the See of Canterbury, we are linked with other Anglican families around the world in the Anglican Communion. Within Canada, we make decisions together for the sake of the whole. And that is not easy when our contexts differ so widely, rural and urban, isolated north and densely populated south, wealthy or not, indigenous and non-indigenous. But as scripture reminds us, we are called to care about all parts of our family, to help one another, and to make decisions together. Our primary purpose is not for ourselves, and not even for the survival of the Anglican Church of Canada, but for the sake of the good news for building communities of faith where the gospel of Jesus Christ can be seen and heard through our witness. And that requires deep listening to one another and a willingness to share. As a national church, we have committed to sharing resources, local to diocese, diocese to internal province and to the national church and the national church in turn sharing through ministries both globally in the communion and locally, including redistribution of funds to support parts of the church here in Canada that need assistance. There is a circle of relationship in that sharing based on our commitment to one another, local to provincial and back to local. And all of this is a tangible expression of St. Paul's call for the stronger and larger to help all, not paternalistically, but as family with the same goals in the gospel, 
and accountability one to another. That is why a portion of resources from every parish goes to the diocese, a portion to the National General Synod, a portion in turn to the Anglican Communion. In each case, those resources serve the local level through programs, information, grants, and connections. And when we hit hard times or the kind of extraordinary challenges we are currently facing, there is a temptation to guard our threatened resources and to keep them for ourselves and our own. But for the Christian community, it is precisely at that such times when we are called to share our joys and sorrows and discover together that we are stronger in partnership when we choose together how we will face those challenges. And that demands transparency and honest, direct, respectful conversations, which we know are not always easy. I have been hearing those conversations across the country, diocese to diocese, parish to parish, and ecumenically with our partners. This will require trust and hard work, Trusting that loving our neighbor as ourselves is at the heart of our relationship. Trust that each member is committed equally to the good of their local expression of the church and the good of the whole expression of our church collectively. And hard work to make those things a daily reality. We in the Anglican Church of Canada are entering a time of transformation. We are discerning our future mission resetting our priorities and our strategies for achieving them. We are examining our governance structures, evaluating our resource requirements and opportunities, finding ways to support the emerging self-determining indigenous church, and so much more. We do all of this as a church committed to being the body of Christ locally, regionally, nationally and globally as Anglicans and in partnership with other churches, including those with whom we are in full communion. Through the pandemic, we have discovered that we are resilient, creative, and capable of change far more than we had thought. I pray that as we move through this period of discernment, we will keep a core understanding of what it means to be the church at the heart of the choices we will make this week and beyond. We are one in Christ, siblings under God. We are a body of different parts needing each other, especially as we walk together with the emerging indigenous church. We are accountable to each other and we are committed to each other and we are all called to go and make disciples. My friends, in the body of Christ, with God's help, may this be so for our gathering in General Synod as we discern God's calling to us. I'd like now to reflect on the life of our church over the past four years as I have experienced it, beginning, of course, with the pandemic that shattered all expectations as we found ourselves literally exiled. An exile from all that was familiar and shifting social patterns. The pandemic uncovered deep inequities as that we had either ignored or been blind to. It raised new moral dilemmas and exposed familiar ones with greater ferocity. The biblical story of the exile in Babylon, living away from all that was familiar, resonated strongly with our experiences during the pandemic. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Became the lament of congregations, clergy and bishops, as we looked to find new ways to engage during the exile. And we found them. Zoom became our new best friend. And we discovered different forms of community through engagement online. 
It was more intimate in some ways as we could actually see each other's faces and not just the back of heads in pews. But it was yet distant in other ways and fully dependent on stable internet access which is not equitably distributed across Canada. We did rediscover riches in our tradition in the daily office as clergy and bishops began and continue to this day to offer online daily morning or evening prayer or compline. We discovered the lost spiritual practice of spiritual communion when physical communion in the Eucharist was not possible. And yet we longed to be home in a place where we could receive the Eucharist in person. We remembered God's faithfulness in the past and trusted that God would be faithful in the present and into the future when the pandemic was over. During this time, death was a ready companion through the physical deaths of loved ones to the death of familiar congregational life and the fear that it would never return. We had to listen afresh to the scriptures, to the spirit, and to the voice of Jesus and find new life rising out of our fears. And to see Jesus in our midst as the disciples did on the road to Emmaus. And we found resilience and hope. We shared our worship life for the world to see and experience through online pre-recorded and live streamed worship. As a national church, with great thanks to our Anglican video, we delighted to see the cathedrals of the Anglican Church of Canada in the Christmas National Lessons and Carol Service in 2020, and then groups of youth and choirs in 2022. And we discovered a new appreciation of our Anglican life across the country. As primate, I was initially at a loss as to how to engage when I could not travel to be with you in person. Soon, however, I discovered I could join worship with pre-recorded sermons or live streaming. I could share in smaller groups that I would not normally be able to visit. If I can say, if you just click on to the next piece, it was there. Thank you. Bible studies, ACW groups and retreats, and youth gatherings where participants could meet me and could engage in question and answer that opened up questions not normally possible with the primate in a formal parish visit or a synod. I enjoyed teaching in an Anglican communion, on the Anglican communion through the Huron College Licentiate program that connected me with people across Canada. Although there was a challenge in ensuring time zones were mastered, I could actually be in several church worship services on a Sunday morning if I started in Newfoundland and worked my way west. Pre-COVID, I traveled and shared in synods and worship across the country. During COVID, I learned to do video recordings, adjust lighting, master Zoom, and listen to the advice of our communications team on improvements. <laughs> With special thanks to Lisa Berry and all of her staff. COVID released its grip gradually and allowed spurts of travel, though only some areas of Canada were open for visitation. I know that many indigenous communities remain fully in lockdown until even this spring. In the last 18 months, I have returned to travel, maybe a little more than I was anticipating, but able to see and hear the stories of our church coast to coast to coast. A particular joy in the last two years has been time to spend Holy Week in one region. In 2022, I spent Holy Week in the Diocese of Saskatchewan, including Easter in Montreal Lake with Bishop Adam Halkett and Confirmation on Easter Day. 
In 2023, I spent Holy Week uh, shared between the dioceses of Yukon for Palm Sunday weekend and the Diocese of Caledonia through the Triduum in a marathon of parish services across the west side of the diocese and up the Nass Valley for baptisms on Easter Day. I have also visited synods, provincial or diocesan, in Saskatchewan, in Ottawa, in Western Newfoundland, and most recently in Central Newfoundland. Wherever I travel across the church in Canada, I meet faithful Anglicans. They are engaged in worship, and they are engaged in being communities of good news for those around them. From soup kitchens and food banks, to justice advocacy for the homeless, to programs for youth and children, to pastoral visiting and care, the list goes on endlessly. And yes, the average demographic of our congregation tends to be over 50 and sometimes more, but I also meet younger adults and youth engaged in their parishes, including, and a shout out to all the youth delegates that are here for this General Synod. I'm going to ask them to stand. Would the youth delegates please stand? I know, I know this is embarrassing, but thank you. I had an opportunity to spend some time with them yesterday morning, and um, we are blessed indeed. We are smaller than we have been in earlier decades, but we are not gone, despite the infamous headline of the journal in January 2020. We remain the body of Christ. That headline was just a statistical moment in time, and its truth will only be revealed in 2040 by what we do now. We are committed to one another, committed to our identity in a wider church, and we are committed to being faithful about sharing God's good news. Let me speak a little bit about the key work of this quadrennium, not a triennium, that connects the ministry across the whole nation through the work of General Synod and its committees and council. First of all, the Council of General Synod we were able to continue the work of General Synod through Zoom meetings that, though imperfect, allowed us to make decisions in new ways. And even before COVID, we had selected the theme, a changing church, a searching world, a faithful God. Little did we know how true that would become in only a few months. The Council of General Synod met online, not just twice a year as when we met previously in person, but several more times as needed to deal with particular issues and in light of the fact that long consecutive hours on Zoom were frankly not healthy. We needed shorter focused meetings. This allowed us to save resources from travel that were uncertain during COVID though I know that government grants sustained many parishes and dioceses and the General Synod through the pandemic, through the assistance that was available. I want to offer a very special thank you to all the members of the Council of General Synod, the standing committees and volunteers who thought they had committed to a triennium of three years and had an additional year thrust upon them when we postponed General Synod last year. I want to thank you for your perseverance and adaptability. In particular, the planning and agenda team of the Council worked hard to create both online and later hybrid meeting space that honoured the needs of all the members, kept everyone safe through COVID protocols, and found ways to engage with fun, to build community together in spite of our distances. I think our, our spring 2022 meeting was a particular highlight when we had a hybrid, I think it was a trivia game, between people online and people in person. If there are any members of that Council of General Synod, would they please stand? And could I ask you to offer them a thank you?
and to all those that are not currently members of this General Synod. At the beginning of the quadrennium, I asked the Council of General Synod to take a serious and consistent look at dismantling racism. Each meeting of the Council included an aspect of learning, education, or reflection upon including the establishment of a dismantling racism task force that will report to this General Synod with its recommendations. Our church is deeply embedded in cultural assumptions that give life to systemic racism just as much as the society around us. Our leadership, clergy and lay, does not reflect the diversity of our church. Our governance structures, diocesan, provincial and national, do not reflect our diversity. And that alone should tell us that there are barriers to participation and engagement for some Anglicans. We need the voices of the whole church, all God's people, of every language, race, and nation to help us to hear the Spirit in our midst. And I look forward to our reflection on the Dismantling Racism Task Force's report and the steps that they are recommending to help us change. General Synod 2019 asked for a new strategic plan for General Synod. The Strategic Planning Working Group listened deeply across Canada to your voices, your needs, your passion for the gospel, and has discerned five aspirations or commitments we want to make. As a member of that planning group, I have been deeply impressed by the dedication of the team that met almost every two weeks for much of the past four years engaged in countless Zoom listening sessions with groups of Anglicans across Canada, pondering what was heard, reaching out to dioceses to support their strategic planning work, and proving that our church has internal skilled resources for mission and ministry among our clergy and lay people. Their recommendations will be presented beginning tonight with the first of their sessions for your consideration. One result of the listening process was the re-emergence of questions around how our structures support mission and ministry in the 21st century. An earlier report in 2013 had made recommendations that have not been fully realized or enacted yet. And so to take a look at that report and the further recommendations of the Strategic Planning Group, I have initiated the formation of a Primates Commission entitled Proclaiming the Gospel in the 21st Century, a look at our structures for mission and ministry. To explore the unfinished recommendations and emerging questions in relation to our national church and to bring recommendations for change to General Synod 2025 and beyond. The General Synod establishes ecumenical relationships through our national office. And I'm deeply grateful for our continuing full communion friendship with the ELCIC and my friendship with Bishop Susan that encourages us to speak together wherever possible, supporting one another in the challenges our churches are facing and exploring issues together. You will hear more about that relationship in our joint address to assembly tomorrow. We also share in the expanded full communion partnership through Churches Beyond Borders with the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and the Episcopal Church. Bishop Elizabeth Eaton and Bishop uh, Bill Franklin representing Michael Curry. Well, Michael Curry meets with Susan and I and Elizabeth Eaton regularly for twice a year for consultation and exploration of common issues. Two that we have immediately and very quickly identified are how our churches are dealing with the issues of racism and of indigenous issues and reconciliation. I do ask your prayers for Bishop Michael Curry. We had hoped he would be with us, but a medical event has meant that he's unable to travel and we pray for his full recovery. At this General Synod, we will consider a new full communion relationship to extend our connection with the Moravian Church in Canada. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to visit the Christ Moravian Church here in Calgary this past March. We were warmly welcomed and one of the things that deeply struck me, and you can see it in this photographs, 
was in the, behind the altar of the Moravian church. Uh, in the place where we would traditionally have a cross was this wonderful artistic rendering of a garment of a shepherd. And it was just a moment of, of aha, Jesus the shepherd. I look forward to the other gifts we will receive potentially through our full communion relationship. We were very honored in 2022 to have the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who responded to an invitation to come to Canada to share in reconciliation efforts by addressing the role of the Church of England in the early years of Canada and of Indigenous and non-Indigenous relationships, in treaty negotiations, and in the colonialism that led to the residential schools. With thanks to Bishop Adam Halkett for his assistance and preparations, we were able to visit at the end of the Provincial Synod of Rupert's Land so that all the Indigenous bishops were able to be present. We visited the James Smith Reserve and Prince Albert, and particularly the James Smith Reserve where only a few months later there was such a tragic mass attack and murder. The Archbishop listened closely to residential school survivors and offered a heartfelt apology and response. He was also able to meet with survivors and leaders from Tayendanega and Six Nations in Toronto. He has a deep concern for the relationship of the church with indigenous peoples in Canada and throughout the Anglican communion. And his visit with us was part of a larger commitment that included a later visit to Australia and a sharing of his experience with the Lambeth Conference last August. And just a month ago, the Sacred Circle met recently near Aurelia, Ontario for the 11th Sacred Circle. I attended as a guest and listened with both admiration and joy to the Indigenous Church by consensus affirm their covenant and our way of life documents as the foundation for a self-governing church within our midst. I heard resilience and strength of identity declared as every member of Sacred Circle came forward to sign the covenant. We also installed Archbishop Chris Harper as the National Indigenous Anglican Archbishop. These documents are clear that the gospel is at the center of the Sacred Circle. The gospel informs and shapes the life of the Indigenous Church in ways that, frankly, I envy. At any time during a meeting or a session, the gospel may be called for. The meeting stops, the gospel of the day is read, and prayer is offered. The gospel is always speaking to the hearts and minds of the faithful as they discern next steps individually and corporately. And this practice is one that I invite the whole church to consider. I invite us to practice it in this meeting when we need to hear the Holy Spirit in our midst through the gospel as we discern God's call now. You will have received through the web manager a daily update that has the gospel of the day there. And we heard the gospel of the day this morning read in morning prayer. And so if there is a moment in this synod where we need to pause and be reminded who we are, please come to a microphone and say, I ask for the gospel of the day. I saw this work at Sacred Circle in a wonderful and beautiful way in the midst of a tense conversation and the gospel was called for and there was silence and there was prayer. And in the conversation that followed, there was a resolution to the, dis to the issue at hand. We will hear more from the Sacred Circle and the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples later in our gathering. And I pray that we will receive their presentation and work with joy and commit to walking alongside, learning in ways that will challenge our whole church to learn and to grow. This past quadrennium has also seen general synod and dioceses face some significant internal challenges. In 2021, 
the handling of a proposed article for an online magazine produced by the Anglican Journal staff hurt many people, especially those who had been willing to share their experience of misconduct in the church and how those were handled by church or church-related institutions. The handling of the proposed article uncovered gaps in our internal systems, miscommunication between management and journal staff, and a lack of clarity in the expectations of different roles, especially in light of the resolution that reshaped our communication committee and created an editorial board in 2019. We also became painfully aware of the power of social media to amplify voices, a powerful tool for justice and for partial information that caused further hurts. An independent examination of that event and its systemic causes led to a series of commitments, including clarifications of the expectations of management, journal staff, and the editorial board, better processes for handling our mistakes that will address harms caused, and deepen trauma-informed responses. We are a church committed to being a safe church, we affirmed the Safe Church Guidelines of the Anglican Communion in 2019, and we committed to review our General Synod Sexual Misconduct Policy. Each of our dioceses has committed to the review of their own policies, and several have embarked on sharing resources for Safe Church training and independent trained investigation teams. Nevertheless, allegations of misconduct do and will still arise. We are committed to investigations of all allegations brought forward. We are learning how trauma-informed approaches can better support complainants. We are committed to a process that holds space for a fair and just investigation, as well as to completing that investigation in as timely a way as possible for the sake of all involved. During this quadrennium, one bishop relinquished his ministry following a substantiated complaint. The former National Indigenous Archbishop voluntarily resigned and relinquished his ministry after a complaint was brought forward. And although the resignation and relinquishment of ministry preempts an adjudication, we have learned that this may be unsatisfying to complainants and others. The church is an imperfect human institution. I deeply lament that the church sometimes causes harm. And I weep at those affected. We are committed to addressing these heart-wrenching situations as effectively and pastorally as we can. But we also repent and ask for forgiveness for our shortcomings in doing this essential task. When this process involves a cleric, a deacon, a priest, or a bishop, There is a necessary inhibition of their ministry. But this is not a pronouncement of guilt. That discernment awaits the adjudication at the end of an investigation. In light of the call for a re review of our policy, and under the shadow of the painful incidents of this past quadrennium, several steps were taken. In the fall 2022, we invited Mandy Marshall, Gender Justice Coordinator for the Anglican Communion, to visit Canada and lead online and in-person workshops on becoming a safer church. She offered webinars on trauma-informed responses and care on power dynamics and recognizing the signs of domestic abuse. Clergy and laity, diocesan chancellors, 
and in-person sessions <clears throat> with the House of Bishops and the Council of General Synod were conducted. The misconduct policy of the General Synod has been reviewed and has resulted in a revised policy that the Council of General Synod recently received for comment. Further consultation is planned with the National Indigenous Archbishop and the Bishop of the Military Ordinariat about that review, revised policy. Key changes proposed to date include regular triennial reviews of the policy and an assurance that records are not destroyed but are kept with no time limit for all investigations. Further safe church training is planned for staff and management team in addition to ongoing training for general synod staff to foster and nurture a healthy working environment. Another tragedy of the quadrennium has been the revelation of unmarked burial sites at residential schools. The agony of Indigenous peoples across Canada poured over our country. We heard about the children who never returned home and whose families were told little or nothing about their burial sites and continue to grapple with the ongoing discoveries as land is being investigated to learn more. Laurel Parson, our archivist, is committed to finding whatever information may be found in burial records of nearby parishes or other archival materials to ensure it is available to families. I know that the bishops are committed to similar assistance wherever possible in diocesan records. And we grieve with the families and grieve for the information that may never be fully known. Our church is not perfect. We are committed to being a better reflection of Jesus Christ, to learning from our mistakes and failures, <clears throat> to repenting when we have erred and living into the grace of our redemption in Christ. And at this moment, I'd invite this gathering into a moment of silence and prayer for all who have been harmed, the pain of the legacy of our church and our need for healing. God of hope, we come before you in our brokenness and need of healing. Through your mercy and grace, we seek your forgiveness for what we have done or failed to do. Give us the courage to learn from past events. And through your spirit, give us the hope to look forward to life with you and through you so that we may overcome the darkness and suffering surrounding us and proclaim your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me move on now to our work in the wider church, in the Anglican Communion, with a picture of our global connection to it. We have Canadian Anglicans serving on commissions and dialogue groups across the Communion. And at risk of missing some, let me name some of the people that work on our behalf. Mary Wells serves on the Safe Church Commission of the Anglican Communion. Bishop Joey Royal serves on the Inter-Anglican Standing Committee on Unity, Faith and Order. I ask you for. <laughs> Bishop Priscilla Shaw, Dr. Anita Gittens, and Reverend Marnie Peterson are our delegates to the Anglican Consultative Council. Bishop Susan Bell is a co-chair of the Anglican Methodist Dialogue. Canon Philip Hobson serves on the Orthodox Dialogue. I serve on the Science Commission and the Standing Committee of the Con Anglican Consultative Council and on the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. And I know there are others who volunteer and assist with the Anglican Alliance and in other uh, parts of the Anglican Communion. Last summer in August, most of the bishops of the Anglican Church of Canada attended the Lambeth Conference. Although it was delayed by four years from its original 10-year plan for 2018, <coughs> ending up in 2022, bishops and spouses from almost all of the provinces of the Anglican Communion gathered in Canterbury around 10 calls to mission and ministry framed not as resolutions, but as a call and a response, 
an invitation into 10 areas of life, of mission and ministry that need to be worked out locally in our own context and may be worked out differently in different parts of the communion. This response will be a continuing cycle as we discern which calls are most needed and answered in a particular way in our own context. And the bishops have been invited to, get, to continue to meet online to share what's happening in their part of the communion. Those original 10 calls have been revised from information received at the Lambeth Conference itself. They're available online. They were re released on Pentecost. And I hope and pray that our dioceses and national church will continue to look at those calls in relationship to our strategic planning. Here you see just a few of the bishops uh, enjoying each other's company and the bishops and spouses as well. A particular joy for me was having been at Lambeth 2008, was to see the difference in the number of women bishops present in 2022. We went from 18 to over 100. <laughs> this time there was a lineup in the women's washroom. <laughs> The primates gather together, much as our House of Bishops does, for fellowship, consultation, worship, and, and prayer. We met in January 2020 in Jordan, in 2022 in the UK, and through online Zoom meetings. We were delighted last November to welcome a second woman primate in Archbishop Marinez Basoto, who is well known to us in Canada through a companion diocese relationship in the Diocese of Huron and through her work in Lambeth. It's a particular joy for me as I was formerly the Bishop of Huron and I was her, the preacher at her consecration as a bishop. So it's a real joy to have her as a fellow primate now in the, house, in the, in the gathering of primates. We are welcomed into that body as colleagues in ministry and the relationships that we build allow for frank conversation in the midst of tensions on particular issues. Last August, I was elected as regional primate for the Americas by my fellow primates, that's North, South, Central America and the Caribbean, to represent the Americas on the standing committee of the Anglican Consultative Council. And this gave me the opportunity <clears throat> to join our delegation of Bishop Priscilla and Anita Gittens and Marnie Peterson in Ghana this past February. Whenever I am in international conversations, it is an opportunity to witness to the rich diversity of Canada, its geography, its theology, its origins, its demographics, to share frankly about our diversity and dispel stereotypes or misinformation that often abound because of the way social media speaks. And especially to raise up our commitment to reconciliation with indigenous peoples facing our colonial past and to speak to the strong faith in Jesus Christ that I find in our church. It is an, also an opportunity to stand with our partners across the communion in the issues that they face. And it allows me to hear the contexts that they are dealing with and to understand better sometimes the difficult headlines we receive that are only partially are part of the information and the truth. In February, the Anglican Consultative Council, which meets once every three years, met in Accra, Ghana. I was there, as I said, with Rosilla, Anita, and Marnie. And the richness of our communion is experienced in that gathering through worship in all languages. We sang, we prayed, we worshipped in many, many of the languages that were present in the room. And even if you did not understand a word, you knew what we were doing in worship together. Through Bible study at tables that were very mixed, I had people from Madagascar, Burundi, Pakistan, Ireland, Scotland, and Canada at my table. 
And we heard the needs of particular concerns, particularly around climate change, indigenous justice, and political advocacy to stories around church growth and discipleship that gave us hope when we feel discouraged about decline in our own church, we see incredible stories of growth and discipleship in other parts of the Anglican communion. In Ghana, we considered the need to address the history of slavery, colonialism, and the ongoing crimes of human trafficking experienced in many provinces. Just prior to the ACC, I attended a consultation on human trafficking and modern slavery in Tanzania and was reminded powerfully that Canada is both a receiving and a sending country and is deeply embedded in the issues of human trafficking, not least of which is around agricultural migrant workers as well as obviously the sex trade that traffics both in and through and from Canada and is linked, of course, to murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. One of the personal responsibilities in the wider church I've enjoyed for over 30 years is engaging in Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue and particularly the International Commission since 2011. And in 2022, it was my privilege to act as co-chair for our annual meeting when the co regular co-chair could not attend, which included a meeting at the Vatican in Rome with Pope Francis. Our work continues on the mandate of how we discern right ethical teaching in our two communities. I'm coming to the end, folks, I promised. <laughs> <clears throat> Earlier in May, I had the privilege of traveling with the young adult pilgrimage to the Holy Land. You will soon hear directly from a few of those 20 young Anglicans who were selected from across Canada to travel to the Holy Land with Canon Richard Lasseur, Sheila McGlynn, and Andrea Mann, and I was able to join them for the first eight days. Diverse in many ways, yet they quickly formed into a community of disciples, reflecting deeply on what they were experiencing, caring for one another, building relationships, and showing that our church is and will be in good hands as they take on further leadership. We are a church in partnership, particularly with PWRDF and the Anglican Foundation. I serve on both of the boards of those organizations and they are full partners with us in supporting our mission and our ministries at home and around the world. And I'm deeply grateful for the work that they do and they will be speaking to us as well. It was my privilege to visit several PWRDF projects in Africa earlier this year to literally launch a water tank in a region that has been in drought for the past three years and be delighted to meet those whose lives are dramatically changed by your gifts that provide water or provide a donkey to transport water or a microfinancing loan to expand a dairy business that allows children to finish high school and go to college. I've seen the effect of foundation grants sustaining infrastructure in isolated churches and rectories and new programs through the Say Yes to Kids. These partnerships are an extension of our life as a church and are excellent. Let me return to where I began. We are gathered in this General Synod to consider the life of our national Anglican Church, not your parish or even your diocese, but our life together as Anglican Christians committed to mutual interdependence and discernment of what will help us connect with each other, with other Christians, with the needs of our world, and with our siblings in Christ around the world. <clears throat> you are members of General Synod discerning together, listening to the Holy Spirit, and helping us support the whole church through what is possible from the national level. Thank you for your commitment to our life together, for taking these days away from family, parish, and other responsibilities, and especially on a long weekend, and to share in living the gospel in a family of interconnected circles, parish to diocese, to province, to Anglican communion, to ecumenical partners, to the whole human family. I invite you to join me in my favorite prayer of the Eucharistic service, 
as we say together, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.